Hello there. I hope you're doing well today. My name is Dr. Katherine Garforth and today I have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Jennifer Buckingham. Today we're going to be speaking about orthographic mapping. So today we're focusing on orthographic mapping, but I wanted to lay a bit of the foundation first and I think it's important for us to discuss why reading isn't a natural process and we've learned this through the different studies that have been done using brain imaging. So from these we know that there isn't just one part of the brain used for reading. There's actually three parts that we need to connect. Can you speak a little bit to those? Certainly. So the, there is, as you say, the, the brain research, um, which has shown that there are these three, three separate areas of the brain that need to connect and work together uh, for reading to occur. It's not just, you know, you start exposing children to print and uh, an area of the brain lights up and away they go. Uh, so it's, it's to, to put it, I guess, in plain language, it's the phonological area, which is to do with sound, the visual area, which is to do with the, um, recognizing the shapes of letters. Um, and then there's the, um, the, uh, the meaning area, the semantic area. So that allows us to then know or understand the words that we're reading. So we see the print on the page, we transform that into um, the sounds that they represent in speech. And from that, we gain access to the meaning of those words. So that's one way in which we know that, that reading isn't just something that um, we can spontaneously do as human beings. The other way we know is that not all children spontaneously just do that. <laughs> Whereas it, with spoken language, the large majority of children, not all, and I, I have to be careful to make generalizations that are 100% true. And I never claim things to be 100% true when, it's, when you're talking about children, there are individual differences. But most children will, by being spoken to and engaging in oral language, will learn to speak and understand um, what people say when they speak to them. This is absolutely not the case with reading. Um, children, most children will learn to read eventually through a variety of different methods, but we also know that the sorts of instruction that facilitates the connections of those three areas of the brain that we were talking about, if they have instruction that does that, they're much more likely to learn to read. So all of those things are leading towards us um, having a stronger understanding of what is actually going on when children are learning to read. Yeah, well, and I think that the big distinction between reading and speaking is that speaking is largely unconscious, right? Whereas when we're learning how to read, we have to bring those unconscious things like our awareness of sound to the consciousness to be able to manipulate them. And that's where we really need to make sure that the children are getting the support that aren't picking it up as naturally as others. Yeah, exactly. And one of the big problems that we have is English is a very orthographically complex language. And I think it's important that we discuss why English is considered to be so orthographically complex and discussing a little bit about how readings developed to become this process for us. So orthographic mapping uh, was, was mentioned in the, the blurb mm -hmm. and orthographic mapping is um, the process of the cognitive process by which we make these connections um, between the, the visual form of the word and the, the meaning of the word. And so orthographic mapping, um, if I sort of break it down into the two separate um, words that make up that term, so orthographic refers to the spelling system. So uh, various different language have, and languages have an orthography um, and it's their spelling and writing system. And the English orthography is quite complex and we'll come back to that later on. So that's the ortho orthographic bit. The mapping bit is the, those connections it's the bonds between um, the three different elements of written language that needs to take place over a period of time. So orthographic mapping isn't a method of teaching. It's a cognitive process. We can't, it's, um, so cognitive um, process are different to say neurological processes in that we can't observe them actually happening. It's a conceptual understanding of what's going on and a good way of describing what's going on. So if we, you know, do a brain scan or a brain slice, we can't see an orthographic map per se, <laughs> but we can know that that is the process that's occurring by observing what is going on in children's brains when, when they're performing particular tasks 
um, and the process that the things that we're asking them to do. Um, and partly through how they perform those tasks, but also equally importantly, what happens when children don't or aren't able to perform these tasks? What's the differences between those two processes? Mm -hmm. Well, and I think one of the reasons why English is so difficult is it's not a language that has just taken all of its words and spellings and created them for that language, right? English is based on several different language backgrounds, and we use these with our spelling conventions, and so it's not as straightforward as some of the other languages. And this is where it's confusing because while there are 26 letters in our alphabet, there are, depending what dialect you speak, 44 different phonemes, right? And those are the speech sounds within our language. And then those phonemes can be represented in writing, in our, in our spelling system, in over 200 different ways. So, this is where it gets more complex. There isn't just a one-to-one -one relationships between our letters that we use or the graphemes and the sounds or the phonemes within our language. Yeah, that's very true. And, and that is the reason why it's so important to teach English in, um, and the writing system and the spelling system in an explicit methodical way because um, children are even less likely than they are in, in what we call a transparent orthography to be able to just pick up through exposure to text, what the relationship is between certain letters and certain sounds. So there are other orthographies such as, say, Finnish, um, Spanish, where that relationship is much more straightforward. Um, and so over time, children, if, if they're exposed to text, will start to, well, some will anyway, start to see, make that paired associate memory um, task much more manageable whereas in English it's it's not that obvious. Having said that in most alphabetic languages the best way to teach uh, reading is through a systematic um, and sequential process. Children are much more likely to pick something up and to learn something if you actually just tell them what what the relationship between you know this this particular shaped letter is and the sound in language rather than expecting them to work it out for themselves. Why do that? Why not just tell them, um, un help them to unlock the code uh, much more quickly and they can start to read more readily. But it is one of the things that's um, a feature of the English language and it makes the Eng English language very fun once you uh, work out how to use it. And part of the reason for that complexity is because English is a very old language and it draws words from um, various different other languages of origin. Um, and as those words have been imported and all put together into the, the language that we use today, they have preserved the, the features of their own orthographies and their own spelling systems, which means there's variations um, on particularly vowel sounds. Vowel sounds are the things that um, are the most complicated um, and can vary considerably in different words, depending on the language of origin, but also depending on the way that the use of language has evolved over time, the way different accents and dialects have been incorporated into um, what has now become a somewhat more standardised language, but not necessarily. So we still have, you know, even within the, those variations in the standard version of English pronunciation, there are also, you know, accents that are entirely different. So the, the vowel sounds in, um, in New Zealand are quite different to in Australia, to in the States, to Canada, to the north of England, for example. And yet, you know, we are still able to understand most of the time <laughs> what each other is saying with those, um, those different pronunciations. And that is partly because we have a spelling representation stored in our memories. So if we're not entirely sure, we can do a little bit of um, setting for variability what, what word does that sound a bit like? A word that I know, do a little bit of fiddling around. And we don't even think about this a lot of the time. We just adjust it according to the, the representation we've got stored in our memory. And then we recognise it as a word that we know. So all of these, these things come together, they coalesce towards it, you know, what is now a fairly sort of solid understanding of the way that we, um, we translate print to speech and vice versa. Of course. And then another thing to highlight is some of the hard and fast rules 
that were taught even 30 or 40 years ago, when we've adopted these new words to our language, have kind of changed. Like, um, you know, going through school, Q was always followed by a U. But now with some, you know, uh, new adaptation of words, well, you can have Q by itself. Yes. Right? Yeah. Or um, words cannot end in the letter V. Well, if they're an English word, but if they've been adopted into English, some of them can be. Yes, exactly. Um, and, uh, you know, then the vowel shifts that have occurred over time. So sometimes um, the, the rule that if you put an, an E at the end of a word, um, then it makes the vowel, the, the long version, not mm. always the case. So time versus give, um, those are, you know, they, they don't necessarily obey the rules. But if you understand the origin of language and why that happens um, and you also have those spelling representations quite solid, then you can work out, you know, why there some, are some exceptions uh, and how that works. It's not entirely random. Um, and so if you work through the, you know, the simple code, um, GPCs, be able to decode um, things that do follow the general rule, then it's much easier then to be able to understand which are the exceptions and, and why and incorporate that then into, um, into your, your um, sight word vocabulary. Right. And when we're talking about helping the kids understand the origin, it's also referred to as uh, etymology, right? So you can give them some background in the etymology of the word so they can understand where these, these patterns are coming and why they don't necessarily make sense. All right, well, let's get a little bit more into orthographic mapping. I want to talk about the three essential components related to orthographic mapping. And we, we discussed these a little bit earlier, but let's go into a little bit more detail. Yeah, well, the first, I guess, is um, phonological awareness. You know, that, that ability to, and, and this is, um, I, I should point out the difference between phonics and phonological awareness. Um, they are still quite often um, used or particularly phonemic awareness and phonics tend to be sometimes used interchangeably. Um, even now, when you think, surely everyone understands the difference, <laughs> particularly if you're, you're writing about reading instruction, but it's not always the case. So phonemic awareness is an oral skill, an oral skill. So to be able to um, perceive the, the individual speech sounds, um, and so it's a, really the first Step. And the second step is to be able to manipulate those individual speech sounds to understand that when you change the order of particular speech sounds, that makes a new word. Mm -hmm. uh, so phonics is the way that those, um, those speech sounds are represented by the letters of the alphabet in various different combinations. So the phonemic awareness is the, is the first one. So the second step is mapping those onto the um, the graphemes. So knowing which, um, so that speech to print and print to speech aspect of it. And for that, then to be able to blend those letters together to make a recognizable word. So blending is the bit that's um, often not emphasized enough because it's not easy for every child to take those speech sounds and then actually put them together so that they make a recognizable word because it has to be done in a way that is um, very fluid and automatic. So the, 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 the GPCs need to be um, learned to a level of automaticity before that blending can happen. Otherwise, you're thinking too hard about what is the, the, the word or the, the letter that I, I'm looking at and what is the sound that it represents. So the blending into a word is the next step. Just quickly, the GPC is grapheme phoneme correspondence. So that's yes. the relationship between the sound and the letter used in the alphabet to represent it. Now, one thing that uh, is important to highlight is just because when we, you know, talk about the grapheme phoneme correspondence, when you're teaching those letter sound relationships, you don't really take into account how the letters that uh, precede it or follow it can kind of change the pronunciation of that sound. So this is one area that some children get held up in because they'll say, well, A says ah for apple, but it changes a little bit depending on the letters before it or after it. So it doesn't sound exactly the same. So the, the idea of a phoneme is really like a, a construct that's not true. 
right? So we have a number of different sounds that we consider to be one, representing one. But in another language, it may be considered to be different ones, or even when we consider the tonality. Absolutely. And so it's, all, um, it's a simplification, I guess, mm -hmm. to, to think about phonemes um, as having a, a single sound. Um, however, our, our brains are able to cope with that. They're able to, to cope with that slight variability in that, as you mentioned, that co-articulation um, mm -hmm. that happens when, you know, the, according to the, the consonant or the vowel that, that's on the other side um, of, of the, um, the letter that you're looking at or the phoneme that you're looking at. Sorry, sorry for me using um, <laughs> words that I haven't explained. So a grapheme is a letter or a combination of letters. The phoneme is the speech sound. The correspondence is the relationship between the two. Uh, so that then the third step, once you've got that um, decoding element, is to then bond that to the, the meaning. And obviously meanings, um, again, there's even more variability in meaning. Uh, however, we can, that doesn't mean that words can only be read in context. Mm -hmm. You know, we can read words out of context. And again, this is another thing that points back to orthographic mapping because it demonstrates if you can just read a single word with no other kind of information around it about, you know, whether it's a sentence or a picture or anything else, if you can read that word and um, at least get one of its meanings, if not, you know, be able to draw on your knowledge of how that word is used to think about all the various different possible meanings. It means that you have actually stored that word, you know, on its own and you can still say it even if it doesn't necessarily make entire sense to you yet. So that, that next bit is the meaning um, and it, it, it can change according to the context. Um, but again, our brains are able to cope with that. They're able to narrow it down to, well, the, the, uh, this word can mean a set number of things. Um, and so I will know more about what particular meaning this word has when I have more information. But by decoding and orthographic mapping, I can at least know a certain amount of information about it, which will help me um, when I see it in the context of a sentence. Yes, of course. And I think the next thing to talk about is the difference between what has been traditionally called a sight word or um, one that someone has memorized just on its shape versus a word that is orthographically mapped. Because I see in many classrooms, you know, teachers sending home sight word lists, send home the Dolch sight words and expect kids to memorize them. And if we talk about why that's not the best approach and how memorizing a word is different from actually mapping it orthographically in your brain. Yeah, I mean, sight word um, is a term that's often used as a way of describing a particular teaching method. And mm -hmm. it's um, often used in the sense of, as you say, sending home long list of words that children are supposed to memorize just the, the way that that word just looks um, and its visual properties, not thinking about um, the phonemic properties that it has uh, or anything else about that word. So um, you can learn a certain number of words in that way, um, but it's not efficient. So there's no transfer that can go from that. There are, there are lots of words that are visually similar. So if you're thinking about, you know, word boxes, mm -hmm. um, you know, a tall word, two short words, a tall word, that could be how many different words. So if you were trying to learn look by the shape of the word, then of course that can be book as well as the same shape. So there's no um, specificity to it and there's no generalization. So it doesn't really meet either of the things <laughs> that you want a, ch a child to have when they are learning a particular word. Having said that, it's sometimes useful to learn a very small number of, um, of words just you know, instantly on site, things that um, don't necessarily fit uh, well into the phonic scope and sequence, but that are really um, useful words that uh, are high frequency, which means they occur often when reading connected text. So a word like the, it's really useful just to know the word the. And that doesn't mean that you don't attend to um, the properties of that word and, you know, 
just present it and, you know, don't think about it at all. But the word the is probably going to, if as a decodable word, be well down the phonics scope and sequence if you're talking about a systematic um, introduction of, of graphemes and phonemes. So um, it, it's useful to learn a small number of words in that way as sight words, but to try to learn all of them and expect children to be able to transfer their ability to read uh, new words based on learning old words just by the visual properties, then it's not going to work. It's not efficient at all. And it doesn't lead to that orthographic mapping. Yeah, and so once they've mapped a word to their brain, then they can recognize it in different settings, different fonts, different contexts, and they don't have to just think of those word boxes or letter boxes to make sure that they make sense. And another way that, uh, or another thing for us to highlight is that it's important when we're doing reading instruction that we also pair it up with the spelling instruction. And we talked about some uh, spelling tests or, you know, memorizing spelling words, but it's also important that we send home these spelling lists for our students. It's better to have them on, you know, a related concept or spelling pattern as opposed to random words taken out from your curriculum or what you're focusing on that week. We're not saying that those aren't important words for the kids to learn how to recognize, but when you're doing a, an exercise like a spelling test, you're trying to teach the relationships. So if you have them related and focused, you're gonna have more success and a higher probability that they're gonna recall them the following week. Absolutely, and our brains like patterns. Mm -hmm. So if when you're devising spelling lists, um, children can see the patterns in the way that things are spelled and pronounced. And also, again, I think we'll come back to this later, also some attachment then to the meaning if you start looking at morphological analysis, then those patterns start to come together in um, what we think of or what's been described as the self-teaching hypothesis. So once that those patterns are established, children are much more likely to be able to transfer that into reading unfamiliar words. They, you know, they self-teach. They're like, okay, I've seen a word that looks like this before and it sounded like this and it's related to this meaning um, and that helps then with that generalisation and transfer. And the other reason to have um, spelling lists that are really carefully um, constructed is that um, our brain needs repetition to learn so it, that that's the other factor is repetition practice leads to learning um, and leads to things being stored in long long-term memory so lists of random unrelated words either in um, their phonological properties uh, or in their meaning I, I've often seen spelling lists um, constructed around a theme and it Sometimes that can be helpful, but more around vocabulary, actually. If it, that's a better way to think about if you're, you've got a theme-based approach and you are working on a particular topic, let's say it's space in class, then to have a list of words that you work on the vocabulary of that word, plus look at the spelling, then, you know, that obviously is going to be really useful for reading comprehension. But in terms of actually learning to spell words and and um, in a way that helps you to be able to spell unfamiliar words, um, but also to be able to um, spell in a relatively fluent automatic way, which leads to better writing, then it's really important to focus on that, um, the, the orthographic mapping component, which relies on those um, graphing phoneme correspondences. Right. Um, and now I was hoping that we could talk a little bit about going from that non-reader to the, the reader that's you know just beginning to decode and then stepping up their fluency level so they have that word orthographically mapped and what we mean by that and that you know the student can recognize the word within a fraction of a second and they're not taking the time to sound out the word letter by letter and just going from there. Yeah, there's a, a few ways to go about that. And as you said, the way we know that a word has been orthographically mapped is if, if it can be read instantly. Um, and as skilled readers, we, we read almost involuntarily. So, you know, if you see a billboard coming towards you as you're driving, um, then you have read it almost before you've decided to read it. You can't help but read it. Uh, so that's kind of what we're leading toward. That's, that's kind of the, the end game. But there are various processes along that way. So 
Um, for orthographic mapping, then I, I mentioned phonemic awareness, um, that, that needs to exist. Um, and uh, there are, there's some discussion about to, to what level of complexity you need to have that because it develops, um, phonemic awareness develops with the teaching of phonics. Um, it doesn't have to be entirely embedded before phonics um, is introduced. There's that, um, initially that automatic um, recall of uh, graphing phoneme correspondences. So, and then things like Elkonen boxes can be really helpful for developing orthographic mapping is so you can actually see the grapheme that represents particular phonemes and then work on, um, on exchanging, so manipulation of words and, and mixing things up by um, substituting letters and, and reading the new word and so on. Once you've got past that, that phase, then it's practice. Like any other learned skill practice um, and just seeing words in connected text um, and being able to read them lots and lots of times, that's the way that the word becomes stored in long-term memory and then available for instant recall. Definitely. Um, just because this fits in, someone sent a question about what strategies can you use for a child who's having deficits in their orthographic processing? Like how can you strengthen going from that decoding student to the one that can have that word mapped orthographically? It's hard to answer that without knowing which, which aspects of the orthographic processing is um, presenting the problem. Um, is it the blending? Um, is it the, the fluency so that being able to say the word automatically when they see it? Can, is it, um, sometimes for some ch children, it's a, a problem with rapid automatized naming. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be very difficult to remediate. That is, that's something that um, there is no kind of intervention. There's no RAN intervention. Um, you can work with it once you've identified that that might be an underlying cause, but there's no easy answer for that. If it's that the, um, the GPC knowledge isn't solid, then it's just, you know, learning. Some children need m many more exposures to GPCs, much more practice in blending um, than others. So they're just two possibilities, but there are numerous. So it's really, I guess the first step is to try and isolate what, what's, what's the sub-skill that's causing the problem. Definitely. And when, you know, when students increase in their fluency, they, it takes less and less time to orthographically map a word. So once the reader becomes more competent, it's, you know, one to four exposures that they need to map it. Whereas some readers to get to that level need to read it a hundred times or even a couple hundred times before it's actually mapped. And it's just giving them that repeated practice. Yeah. To get there. Yeah, I agree. Um, so how can teachers help support orthographic mapping? Well, just really the, the few things that I, uh, I mentioned um, bef before. So teachers can help to facilitate orthographic mapping by, first of all, making sure that phonemic awareness is there, at least to some level. Um, and so it's very difficult to uh, learn the letter that corresponds with a particular sound if you can't hear what that sound is to begin with. So that mapping process relies on being able to um, segment a word, hear its individual sounds, um, or you know, a, a, an approximation of it, as you mentioned, because the co-articulation elements, but a simplified version, and to be able to connect that to a letter or a group of letters. So developing phonemic awareness, making sure that knowledge of letter sound correspondences or GPCs is solid, uh, working on blending in a rapid and smooth way um, and building confidence that, you know, that children uh, actually can see the word and say it. So moving from decoding and sounding out into see the word and say it, so we'll call that the fast way. And um, confidence is really important there. A lot of children hesitate and second guess themselves. Uh, so that, that's the next phase. And then um, just lots of practice, reading words, it's lists of words, but also in context so that they are um, building their ability to um, read in a natural and fluid way. And, and also just um, number of exposures, it just comes down to, you know, seeing the word and reading it lots of times. Yes, of course. Um, now we had another question 
asking about whether it's better to group students based on their blending ability or their um, GPC knowledge, so their um, ability to identify graphemes and phonemes. Um, it depends on what your your grouping is for, whether it's for instruction or whether it's for um, you know reading practice using decodable books. Um, so I, again, I can't really answer that um, straight away, and perhaps a bit of both. You know, if it's for instruction in um, learning grapheme phoneme correspondences, then you would put teach the children together who um, need whether it's initial instruction or um, intervention, supplementary instruction, who are working on the same part of the, the GPC scope and sequence. If it's for, um, for reading from decodable connected text, for example, then perhaps the children who are struggling with blending might be better to work together. So I think it would be just, for, you know, different, um, different approaches for different purposes. Right. Now, um, we're wondering why some people struggle with orthographic mapping, and you had mentioned the RAN, rapid automatized naming, and also uh, working memory is kind of a related issue. So maybe if we just talk about a couple of the common reasons that a student may struggle with orthographic mapping. Sure. So the first reason that a child might struggle with orthographic mapping is their uh, phonological awareness and phonemic awareness, their ability to, to hear the separate sounds in speech. Um, the second thing is they just don't have solid uh, knowledge of the alphabetic code. They, they don't have rapid recall of the phoneme that represents particular graphemes and vice versa. Um, the third reason could be that uh, they have a weakness uh, or a slow um, production of speech sounds, which we call rapid automatized naming. Um, and that's something that's quite difficult for, for teachers to remediate. It's quite difficult for reading specialists to remediate. But it is something that, need, that if a child has persistent difficulties with decoding and fluent word reading, it, it may be useful to investigate that so that you, at least you are aware of the thing that's causing the difficulty and that that child does just need a lot of extra attention and a lot of extra practice. Right. Now, is there any other way of remembering words without visual memory? Uh, remembering them in what way, I suppose? <laughs> it's, Not it's a difficult question to answer. Um, I, I, I don't know. It's a question that someone... Yes, so <laughs> we, we remember words that someone has taught, just spoken to us. You know, if someone tells you their name um, and it's a name... Um, whether it's a familiar name or an unfamiliar name, you can remember it um, without it having seen it. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you're much more likely to remember it if you've seen it spelled um, and you've seen it written down because of that, um, or if, if, even if you haven't seen it, but they've, they've told you how it's spelled. So you then can create a mental representation of the spelling. And again, that's another thing that leads us to, to believing that the orthographic mapping um, concept is a really solid one um, and uh, adds more evidence to that. So all three of those things um, need to be in place for a word to be um, really strongly embedded in, in long-term memory. Okay, so they're asking, can orthographic memory be done only when one knows the sounds of the letters? Yes. Yeah. All right. So how can teachers support students in learning to spell homophones with words like great and great? So um, homophones are um, an interesting uh, issue in this particular area because it's there's a few different ways to approach that. The, the, the one that is most um, most supported through evidence is something called set for variability. So we then use the, the context of a word once we have narrowed down the potential pronunciation and meaning to a small number. Um, so a word, for example, like tear or tear, mm -hmm. um, felt the same. Um, and then there are other words um, like the example where they sound the same but have different meanings. 
So in that case, we do use context and we do adjust. But being able to use orthographic mapping and um, phonics to get to, um, to narrow the options down to a couple makes our reading much uh, more efficient uh, and much quicker. So that, that's how we work around that. And it's, all, it's, it, it's around that, you know, complexity of the English orthography. We can't ignore that. That just exists. It, it makes it rich and interesting, makes it more difficult to learn. But again, you know, once you have, there, there are certain stable properties of words that have some variation among them, in, whether it's to do with pronunciation or, or meaning. And we use those stable properties to get to an approximation. And then we can adjust um, the part that we're not sure about according to other information. Yeah, and I also think um, bringing in some etymology might assist in the situation too, especially with there, there, and there, right? Understanding that uh, whether it's an apostrophe or the location, I think um, that definitely helps some students. Um, so how does reading strategies like looking at pictures, using context cues, and skipping the word prevent orthographic mapping? They all, they all draw students' attention away from the word and the letters in the word. So the best way to read a word is to look at the letters um, and decode through the word. Uh, and if there is something that needs adjusting according to, to context or pronunciation, then you make that adjustment um, after you've decoded through the word. So um, anything that involves either skipping or um, looking at the pictures is not going to focus the brain's attention on the graphophonemic properties of the word. Um, and if we're not, we learn what we pay attention to. So instructional strategies that don't direct attention to the, the thing that we want to learn uh, are not going to help us to learn that. Yeah, well, and again, if we look at the fMRI research and looking at how individuals approach reading, there's studies showing that students who are poor or struggling readers do use those strategies of looking for contacts, looking at pictures, moving their eyes away from the word when they're trying to figure out what it says, whereas the skilled readers are the ones that are paying the attention to the letter sound correspondences. So when we promote strategies like guessing or looking at the pictures, we're giving these students instruction to read like poor readers and not like skilled readers. Yeah, that's right. And, and eye tracking studies similarly. So there's a lot of information about what, what we do when we're reading that have come from those studies that show we are actually, when we're reading a word, we are looking at we're fixating on the word that we're reading um, and we are we see every single letter in that word we don't sort of we don't guess um, at what the word is we we read the word according to its exact properties but also that um, we are sort of reading a tiny little bit ahead you know um, at the same time as we're focusing on each word um, and that we are not predicting based on meaning we are predicting based on what are, what are the first few letters in that word and what are the graphophonemic properties of what that word is likely to be. So it's much more efficient if you learn how to pay attention to the, the letters in the word um, and then therefore its pronunciation and its meaning than if you're using, you're trying to pull in a bunch of other information and, and, and cues at the same time. Right. So how does <clears throat> teaching phonics in a systematic synthetic approach that's laid out sequentially and you're making sure the student learns all the letter sound correspondence help support the orthographic mapping? There's a few ways that um, a synthetic phonics approach helps that orthographic um, math, uh, mapping process take place. One is by, um, first of all, just really making the understanding of the concept of um, print to speech and um, speech to print understandable, that it's a reversible process, that it's um, relatively predictable once you know some of the rules and some of the exceptions and why there are exceptions. Um, it helps with that blending 
because it's introduced very early. Um, the selection of GPCs in a good synthetic phonics program will be really carefully done. Um, so we know, for example, that children will be able to blend continuous sounds more easily when they're learning to read than, than um, stop sounds. So for example, it's easier to blend Sam than tin. Um, if you're a beginning reader, because you can el lead the, the sounds together, you can elongate them and, and then blend them together and then say them the, the faster way. So that's, that's one way that a synthetic phonics approach works. The other is that it, it really draws attention to those graphofeminic properties. Um, there's a lot of practice there's cumulative review, there's mastery, there's all of those things that we know about how children learn and move things in from their short-term and working memory into long-term memory and therefore become fluent. So there are so many ways in which a synthetic phonics approach um, uh, is um, aligned to our understanding of orthographic mapping, that it, it just makes sense that, that, that it will you know, one will eventually lead to the other. Again, there's there's uh, variation amongst different children, but it it is the approach by which we know most children will learn to read most quickly. And some children, after learning, you know, uh, most of the code, will go into that self teaching phase, and they'll start to see the the patterns. They will um, put that together in a way that allows them to make um, a transference from what they have explicitly learned to new and unfamiliar words. For other children, they need the whole code taught explicitly and systematically. But we don't know which children at the start of the teaching process are going to take off partway through and start to self-teach um, and the ones that are going to need to be taught explicitly the whole lot. So the best thing is to plan to teach all children the entire code. That way there are no gaps um, and we can be pretty confident that all children are going to be able to decode fluently um, and that orthographic mapping process will take place that leads to that automaticity. Um, and the ability, and I guess it's really important to mention here, the whole point of doing this is so they can read for meaning and enjoyment. And so yeah. it's a means to an end. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to state that because there is always the accusation that when you're focusing on word level reading, that it's still mechanical and, you know, you're ignoring the, the other aspects of literacy. And of course we're not, this is a means to an end. This is how we get children to enjoy reading. Um, and the reason they enjoy reading is because they don't find it hard. And that's, that's the aim. Exactly. And I, I feel it's important to definitely highlight that decodable books are a great place to start because in those books, you're getting children to read words that they have the skills to decode and so that they know what they need to do. And you can pre-teach, you know, those five to 10% of words that may be in the book that aren't decodable based on their current skill set. And then they're able to get through these readers fairly quickly once they figure out the process and move on to those texts. Whereas when we're using the predictable texts that highlight, you know, guessing and using the context clues or the pictures, you're not really facilitating the student in looking at those letter sound correspondences and being able to map those words. I'm really glad you mentioned that because that um, is so important, that decodable text in, in the early stages particularly, so that um, children are getting that exposure to or repeated exposure to the same sorts of um, spelling patterns and then they become uh, mapped and embedded. And um, yes, I mean, early decodable text um, th they can seem quite constrained, um, but then so does early predictable text. It's, you know, they've, it's, it's super boring, the early predictable readers. So, but they don't have the benefit of actually achieving the goal that you're looking for either. So, um, and then decodable readers actually, the, the newer ones that are becoming available now um, are really great when they start to add you know, more into the phonic sequence. And you don't have to get very far into a phonic sequence before you start to be able to write if, if you're clever. And there are some very clever writers of decodable books. We, I'll um, uh, have to mention some, you know, the, the authors of the, 
um, multi-lit decodable books, they're called initial lit readers, are so clever. Their imaginations and their facility with English language is just, um, it's quite astounding, you know, <laughs> when I read them, I think, you know, to be able to come up with the little stories that they do with the small number of, of letters and letter combinations that they're allowed within the phonic scope and sequence is, um, is, is really quite amazing. But it doesn't take long before you can start to write little stories that are actually really engaging and has some interesting vocabulary and other sorts of language features. So, um, yeah, I hate to see decodable books sort of written off as being always not authentic literature. Sometimes they're just as good as anything else I see on the market that are, you know, that are natural language children's books. So the, the line kind of gets blurred the more you move through the code and more GPCs that can be included. In those very early stages, though, it's all about the orthographic mapping and the automaticity and the blending. Yes, and I'd argue that any skill, you have to start at the basics. I mean, think about learning how to walk or playing the piano or learning mm -hmm. how to roll over. Like you have to do the same thing repeatedly until those muscles get the memory and are ability, able to do it. So why would it be any different from reading? Yeah, I, precisely. I think those analogies are great. Yeah. All right. So I think the next important thing to talk about is how we can go that one step higher past phonics instruction and bring in the morphological instruction to help facilitate that orthographic mapping. And this is because we're able to help integrate the meaning and the spelling patterns together. Yes, and, and that, that morphological element of English is the second layer, I suppose, of the way in which English um, orthography is systematic. So it's systematic at the sound level, um, again, you know, with varieties in, within the system. But those varieties within the system are often related to that second layer, which is the morphological level. So um, a morpheme is the smallest part of a word that, that has a, a meaning attached to it. Um, and so knowing sometimes the morphological um, aspects of a word, um, you can, it's various different terms used to describe that. It um, can be morphological analysis. Sometimes it's called word inquiry. There are lots of different ways that people talk about that. But that is actually it's a, a useful thing to introduce um, relatively early in the reading process. But the, the evidence at the moment is largely pointing towards introducing morphemes um, once some grapheme phoneme knowledge is sound because it is a complicating factor and we want children to be able to develop some confidence um, at least with the systematicity of the, the writing system um, at the phonological level before we kind of introduce that that next layer of complexity and children can cope with that you know you, you learn the foundations um, you learn how to decode CVC words, for example, and then you start to bring in things like um, really useful morphology, um, like adding in the S after, you know, onto a noun means there's more than one. Um, and some, and also, you know, kids can understand sometimes, you know, that that S is pronounced differently depending on the word that it's attached to. Sometimes it's a soft S, sometimes it's the harder S. Um, and voiced versus un unvoiced. And, you know, different teachers have different ways about, you know, going about that. So um, voiced and unvoiced is, um, say, S versus Z. Um, and so S can be pronounced both ways. Again, children can learn that, but you don't want to throw in that complexity too early in the scheme of things. They can cope with it, but not when all of that information lands in their inbox, so to speak, at once. Um, so it's about planning that in a really careful way um, and giving the information that they need at the time they need it and at the time that cognitively they're prepared to be able to add it to what they already know. Um, and so it's very useful. No, one's, no one discounts the, um, the need um, or the usefulness of understanding morphemes. It's where, when and how, I think, is the part um, that needs to be thought about most carefully. How would the relationship between orthographic mapping and morphemes affect initial reading instruction sequence? And it's adding it in when it's appropriate. So when you're first teaching those initial uh, grapheme phoneme correspondences, you know, say if you're using 
SAT pin, the first, you know, what is it? Um, letters that you teach are S A T P I N. You're not going to be saying, well, this is the letter S. It makes the sound S, S. And when we add it to an end of the word, it means that we can have more than one. <laughs> We're not going to do that in the first introduction of the letter S. Um, no, I mean, I, I'm sure some people do, but um, <laughs> evidence suggests that it's, it's not the most effective way to do it and it's not ignoring and this is again something I think um, needs to be said that children are aware as they're being taught a phonic scope and sequence that there are exceptions often the thing that that is most um, showing them that demonstrating that is their own name because mm -hmm. names have such irregular spellings so they're aware that there are differences and they can incorporate and you don't ignore it you don't say to a child no that's not how you spell you spell your name <laughs> because, because it doesn't meet with our phonics scope and sequence you acknowledge that discuss it but the reason that you have a scope and sequence is to make sure that there are nothing is left out mm -hmm. you know to you know children will be learning other things about the english language alongside a phonics scope and sequence in parallel and at some point they'll all come together and they'll have that knowledge all, you know, amalgamated. So you don't ignore it, but the, that scope and sequence is there just, you know, so we can be confident that all of the content has been learned and no child is missing out. Right. And a follow-up to this one is, um, can morphemes map automatically too? Yes, they do. Um, you know, we we uh, map a word as its entire representation. And we are then able to break that word up when we pay think about it and analyze it and pay attention to it but you know we recognize the word quickly as as quickly as we recognize the word quick so you know the morpheme in that is quick and lee we put them together um, and you know they, they become unitized and automatic in the same way mm -hmm.